hey, I'm going to ask God's Holy Spirit to help us in what we are about to enter into as his word and, and a, an account of his resurrection. Father, would you fill us with your spirit, the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead, may it be upon us now and forevermore, and draw many to the name of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, so... Um, the Avenue Church has been about a vision. It's a two-year vision. It's called Vision 2020, and I just want to introduce you to it because it's been kind of framing all that we've been uh, moving towards, and it's, a, it's called Greater Things. Jesus promised in John 14 that we would be doing greater things than he did. Now, that's a crazy, audacious promise, and it doesn't mean we'd be doing better. It meant that we would have a, a more significant reach than he actually did in his three years, and what he was talking about is the church of Jesus Christ, and primarily that we would be preaching the gospel and we would see so many people come to the name of Christ and put their faith and trust in him that it would be like radically like it would be a radical nature type thing and, and so he called it greater things and and we've been we've been working towards that and we've been believing God's God for that and asking his favor in that and so um, this Easter service is part of what we believe God is doing it's just like drawing men and women boys and girls to the name of of Jesus. And so the question that I want to start us off with today for that to actually uh, be possible is just this idea of what if. What if? So I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the business of answering a lot of questions right now. I have a three and a four-year-old. And so um, there are a lot of whys, not necessarily what ifs, but whys. And so I'm, my, my mind is kind of like I've got quick responses. I can go three deep or I can go one deep and just give you because that's how God wanted it. But like we're going to go a couple deep today. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to work together on this, on this idea of what if, what if this is all true? Like what if... This whole resurrection and, and the fact that you, just as you are, can believe and belong to something that would have eternal favor and blessing come your way. What if it's true that there was a cosmic change today when Jesus walked out of the grave? I mean, what if all that stuff was true? How would that change right now? That's what I want to know. I want to know. I want to, I want to walk in that what if here for a minute with you guys. And so uh, one, of the, one of the great things that we've been focusing on here at the Avenue Church, and we see it in the Gospel of Luke, which is where we're going to be today, is this idea of hospitality. And Jesus was incredibly hospitable. And, and the idea of, of hospitality is this, this idea of preparing for others and welcoming others. And, and one of the things that we've been looking at, because we feel like we can learn a lot from the stuff around us, is one of your favorite places, probably one of your getaways this, later this, this Easter Sunday, is can we get a picture of it? I know a lot of you are going to be hanging out at the Ritz later today, probably, okay? Now, that's, that's the one in Montreal because that's the one that was actually voted most, um, I forget how the, the website worded it, but most hospitable. And, and they, they were, like, of all the chain, this one in Montreal was the one, okay? And so what they were saying is there's a couple of things about this one that makes it unique and stands out. And so I was just doing research on the Ritz-Carlton, you know, because I want to know our people, right? We're Ritz people, aren't we? And, and so I'm dressed for it. So anyways, listen, th there's a couple of things that I've been learning about the Ritz, but there's one thing that I feel like is, is actually like the gospel, but they don't even know it. And so we're just, we're just using it. And it's under their credo. It's credo number three. You guys have an outline actually to take home and check out later if you want to, to follow along. You'll see it there. And this is credo number three. The Ritz-Carlton experience enlivens the senses, instills well-being, and fulfills even the unexpressed wishes and needs of our guests. I'm here to tell you the resurrected Jesus enlivens the senses and meets us in surprising ways and fulfills even our greatest needs and wants. If that hasn't happened to you yet, man, today just might be your day where you encounter the resurrected person of Jesus and he begins to do that in you and for you. That's our prayer. That's our prayer because we believe the experience that the Ritz is talking about is actually reserved at the highest level for the person of God. 
Like those longings are really good. When you're going to the river, when you're entering into the river, the longings that you have that you're hoping to experience, they're really good. And I'm here to tell you, lean into them more than you ever have. But if you haven't found them in Christ, you haven't experienced them fully. And so it's just our invitation to experience these things in the hospitality of Christ. Now, we, we see here that in, in Luke chapter 22, Jesus is going to set up a meal, okay? And, and one of the things that we know about Jesus is he loved to eat. I, I love Jesus for a couple of reasons. This isn't the primary one, but this one counts for me. Jesus loved to eat. I mean, this guy was always around a table. And we see here, throughout the whole Gospel of Luke, he's either kind of like going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. It's a bit of a generalization, but in a meal with Jesus, um, Tim Chester's book, he kind of like works through that. And it's like radically awesome to see Jesus at work in a meal, fulfilling our physical senses in order to show us a greater fulfillment he's going to give. Well, he's about to leave, right? In this particular context, Jesus is about to leave. And what's awesome is he doesn't give them a five-point message. He doesn't, um, you know, kind of like give them a lecture on this or that. What he gives them is this meal. He gives them this meal, and as a matter of fact, he positions his disciples and and you and me in between this meal that I'm going to read to you and a meal that's coming. Watch this. Here's what he says in Luke 22. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God. Here's what Jesus is doing. He's saying, we're in between meals. Okay, now we all can, we all can appreciate a meal. Check out this picture of a, you know, when I show this picture up here, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, that's either, either you had some pancakes and you're okay right now and you're fighting your sugar crash, or you're thinking about that Easter brunch that you're going to have or that Easter meal later that you're going to have. But all of us know what it's like to look forward to a meal, right? Like meals are this amazing place. And what Jesus does is he meets us in a place where we want to be coming to where we are in order to take us to a place we could never get to without him. That all happens around a meal. And in this particular passage, Jesus is saying, listen, I'm leaving you with with the Lord's Supper or or communion or or whatever tradition you might be used to calling it. It, It's where the, the bread is broken and the drink is poured out and you're doing this in remembrance of me. And and what that signified was that Jesus was going to to become what those elements were symbolizing. He was going to be broken. His blood was going to be poured out, and there was a reason for that. Jesus was like, listen, I need you to remember what's about to happen because it's about to get crazy. It's about to get crazy because hours after this meal, Jesus would be arrested. He would be tried. There'd be a mock, you know, verdict. He'd be declared guilty, and he would go to a cross, and and he would die. And by all intents and purposes, it looked like it was over. But Jesus gave them this meal to remind them it wasn't over. He was actually going to win by losing. Because what Jesus was saying in this meal was that he was going to be broken so you and I didn't have to be. His blood was going to be spilled so ours wouldn't have to be. Here's what Jesus knew. He knew his father. He knew his father intimately, and he knew his father was righteous and pure and holy. And that anyone who would come before a righteous and holy and pure God in an impure way, which is the way I come and the way you come in the condition of our hearts, we would suffer consequence. We would suffer punishment and separation from the holy and pure and righteous God. And the punishment is eternal separation. It's, it's, a, it's an eternity in hell without the favor of God. That is what I rightly deserve. It's what you rightly deserve. But Jesus said, wait, I'm intervening. I'm giving you a meal to remind you that I'm going to stand in your place on that cross And the things that would have separated you from the Father, they're going to actually separate me. I'm going to personally take upon your sin. And the Father will crush me. He will break me. My blood will be poured out so that yours doesn't have to flow. And on the third day, 
I will not be a martyr. I will come back having shown that I've defeated sin, I've defeated death, and the payment is now available for you to receive through faith and repentance, through giving up on your own self-saving efforts and saying, Jesus, you are all I want and all I need. I surrender to you. That's the meal he leaves us with. But then he hints at this other meal. If you check it out in the passage, he hints at this other meal, that the gospel is not just a gospel of forgiveness. The gospel is not just a gospel of being made right with God now through faith and repentance. The gospel is good news that Jesus is coming back That the resurrection was a foreshadowing of the fact that he's going to walk out of heaven and he's going to come back and renew all things. And there is a greater meal in store for those who come to Christ. A meal of complete and full renewal for both you personally and us here in all creation. Man, it's such good news that Jesus had to leave us with one of our favorite things to be reminded of it over and over and over again. And so, man, I question, I ask pretty much on a daily basis. The question I struggle with on a daily basis is, what if this is actually true? What if what I just threw down to you is actually true? I just want to walk through that with you in our time remaining. So what if it's true? Luke 24, verses 5 and 7. The women, um, are, are the women who had surrounded Jesus, uh, th- they're on their way to honor a dead man. They're doing the, the right and noble thing. They've prepared spices, and they're going to give honor to this person that they just lost. We in our family lost a dear person within the last few days, Lily. And our hearts break for Lily in the fact that we've lost her temporarily. But we know that because of today, she will be found again with us in Christ. The women did not know that. The apostles, the disciples, they didn't know that. They were confused. They were, compl- they were perplexed. They were upset. And so they had gone to the tomb to do what was right, which is, wor- which is give honor to a dead man. And upon their surprise, they see that the stone has been rolled back. Now, I love the commentary that I was reading because the commentary said the stone wasn't rolled back so Jesus could get out. Like, he rose from the dead and was knocking and trying to get out and, like, really struggling about it. This resurrection body of Christ was able to do amazing new things, and he wouldn't have to worry about rolling a stone away. The stone was rolled away for you. The stone was rolled away for me as, like, an invitation to come and see, man. Like, he's not here. It's true. And that's, that's what the women come up upon, this, this stone that's, that's rolled away. And here's, what the, here's what the angel says. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day day rise. The angels are like, what are you doing here? He's not, he's not here. He's not, it wasn't condemning. It wasn't, and we don't actually know the tone behind the angel's voice, but it was kind of like, if you're looking for the Jesus that he said he was going to be, you're in the wrong place. This is not a dead Jesus. This is an alive Jesus. This is not a a Jesus that wants your spices. This is a Jesus that wants your worship. This is a Jesus that doesn't need your honor. He doesn't need you to give him like monumental, um, you know, plaques and things like that. This is a Jesus that is calling you to fall to your knees as your Savior and your King and worship him. That's the Jesus the angels knew and were inviting the women and the apostles and you and me to know this resurrected Christ the stone was rolled why are you here he is risen and then the angels recount everything that Jesus told them would happen 
his death, his resurrection, his victory in this area. And so, man, I just want to know, what if I can really believe this? What, what if I can really honestly uh, believe this? I think it's important, uh, I'm always reminded by my dear friend John O'Brien to go over some of the facts of the resurrection during Easter. Some of the, like, just historicity of Easter. The fact that this isn't just me up here, like, super psyched about this guy I think rose from the dead. That there is monumental historical backing to the resurrection of Christ. And if that's true, you've got to do something about it. Like, you can't remain neutral. There is fantastic history behind it of which I can't go into in our time remaining but I have a few thoughts that I hope the Holy Spirit will help to trigger in your mind because I'm a heart guy I want to get at your heart but some of you are like yeah that's cool that you're into it but you didn't touch here so I'm praying the Holy Spirit touches here for those of you who still have some skepticism about the resurrection and the Holy Spirit does the convincing since you know I can a couple of couple of thoughts as to the history why you can't believe in the resurrection. These come at us from author and pastor John Piper. The first one is Jesus spoke of it. Jesus spoke of his own resurrection. He's the one who talked about the fact that he was going to rise from the dead first, and then he did it. It's like Jesus was the original smack talker. You know, we're in the NBA playoffs, and smack talk is huge. It's like the normal language of NBA playoffs. You don't see it a ton, but you know, you got guys, John, you got Kevin Durant coming back. Like, I'm Kevin Durant. Who do you think? You know, like, you got, it's all over. There's smack talk happening all over. Listen, Jesus was like talking smack to the devil. He's like, look, he thinks he's going to win, but I'm coming back. I'm going to crush that guy. I'm going to crush him in three days. He's going to think that he's won the war, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, don't count me out. I might be down, but I'm coming back. I'm going to walk out of that grave, and I'm going to show you what's up. That's the Casey translation of what you just read, okay? <laughs> but that's kind of how it went. So the first reason that, 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 um, that you can have confidence in the resurrection is that Jesus talked about it. He talked about this crazy out-of-the-box idea, and then he did it. All right, wh wh what else? Number two, um, the disciples were transformed immediately. Like, immediately, the disciples go from being kind of like how I am, you know, a, at least a few times a day, which is like caught up in my fear and my cul-de-sac of self and like, oh my goodness, what happened to Jesus? I'm all alone. And, and, and they went from that moment to being martyrs for the faith, to being people who were willing to step out and be like, Jesus is alive and I'm willing to die for it. It wasn't progressive sanctification. It wasn't like they read their Bibles and they went to youth group or apostle group, you know, and they had like Sam Powers, you know, discipling them, and they got in Rob Sweeten's MC, and then they met Laura Corwin. No, no, it wasn't like that. They went from being cowards to being these people who were like, what? It's okay. Peter, crucify me upside down. How does that ha how does it go from Peter denying Jesus to being willing to be crucified upside down unless they actually saw in bodily form a real and living Jesus? These were logical, fearful men and women who many of them gave their lives for what they said was true. How about number three, a thriving church? The church of Jesus Christ is doing really well. I don't know what you think about the church here. You might have different thoughts about the church in America versus the church in Brazil versus the church in China. It's cool to have your thoughts and opinion. But here's the deal. There has been a worldwide movement that the world has never seen nor will ever see in the face of Christianity, and it's all based on this dead Jewish rabbi getting up again. It's all based on the resurrection. So it's, it's not like, oh, his teaching was great, and that's what changed the world, or he gave a lot of people a, bread, a lot of bread, and that's what changed the world, or he healed a lot of people. No, 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 no. It's that Jesus was dead and now alive again. And there's like billions of people who are like, sign me up. That doesn't happen outside of a historical resurrection, especially, watch, check this out. It started in Jerusalem, which was the worst place to start a lie if it was a lie because everybody saw what happened and could just go produce the body and be like you guys are lying here he is this whole thing started in the worst place possible the most dangerous place possible to start a lie if it was a lie 
so you know the history is just mounting up and that's just from like me the heart guy Imagine if you had somebody up here who's got like the brain of John Piper giving this to you. Hey, check this out. Number four, and this might just be the, this might just be my favorite one. I don't know. The last two are tied. It's close. It's close. It's close. Hey. The, the tomb was empty. <laughs> the, the tomb is empty. Like you can't. You can't find the body because the body's not there. Notre Dame, horrific thing happening, burns up. We got people uh, heroically going to get artifacts and things like that that are really important to church history, but nobody went after the bones. You know why? They're not there. You can't find a dead man's bones. The tomb is empty. And everyone knew where he was buried and went and looked and was like, I have no explanation for that. That really makes sense. Besides, this guy is alive. Well, you might be like Cora Joy. You guys know who Cora Joy is? She's the, my little three-year-old delight. And Cora Joy loves to start the morning with popsicles. Now, I'm not saying whether she gets them or not, but I am saying her mama's been out of town a little bit and we're down on popsicles, so you do the math. <laughs> but this morning, she, I think she was trying to be healthy. And here's what she said. She came to me and she's like, I think she was trying to up it. And so she, instead of for a popsicle, she asked for gummies. You know, I think she was trying to do her, I think she was trying to do her best at, at, at umping. Now, I just want to, I'm going to go ahead and be real with you. Um, if we have, hopefully, if, if there's a couple of more than first-time parents in here, because if you're a first-time parent, this is going to, uh, you're going to have hard getting past this, the rest of the message, based on what I've been giving her for breakfast. But if, you, if you've got like three or four kids, you're going to be like, well done, soldier. Um, she's been getting popsicles, but I've been making her eat like three or four carrots before that, okay? I just want to let you know that's how our morning's been rolling. But this morning was different. She asked for gummies, and I was like, hey, baby, the, the, the gummies are, they're out. And thankfully, we're in a family like mine where it's not our spiritual gift to throw the box of gummies away when it's out. I'm not trying to create fights. I'm just saying you might be here with somebody who's really good at getting the gummies and providing the gummies but forgetting to throw the box out. If that's you, you would have been in great fortune with me because here, and I'm quoting to the best of my knowledge, Cora Joy, when I told her, there are, no go, there are no more gummies. Here's quote, Cora Joy, three years old. Show me the box. <laughs> so I went to the pantry, and I got the box. And I was like, oh, well done. Way to not throw stuff away. And I said, here, baby. There are no more gummies. The box is empty. Amen. The box is empty, people. The box, the grave, the grave is empty. And I pray the Holy Spirit helps you to see that this morning because it leads to sort of my final evidence and I'm not going to call them up here. I'm not even going to ask them to stand. I'm just going to start saying their names. It's people like Mitch. It's people like Daniel Devlin. Man, it's people like my wife. Who, who, there was a time in their life when they were significantly far from God. And they were full of self and darkness and despair. And if you look at them now, if you look at them now, you will see people who are vibrantly and lovingly following Jesus at great expense to themselves, even to the point of opening their home to strangers and calling them son and calling them daughter, even to the point of joining the local church and giving his life for this, even to the point of beginning homeless ministries. These are people that were consumed and trapped in the web of self, and the only thing that could ever break them free was a redeemer stronger and more alive than they were, and his name is Jesus. So you just look around, and this church is filled with historical evidence of the resurrection.
man, I'm just wondering what if it's, what if it's true and what if I can really belong? What if somebody like me can really belong? Check this out. Now, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Ladies. It was like ladies morning out, okay? And so, you know, this is in a man's world, I want you to know. The context of Jesus' resurrection was in a man's world, and God was like, give me the ladies. I'm starting with the ladies, when, when he broke into humanity, he started with the shepherds. And when he broke back into life, he started with the ladies. Which, by the way, if you're going to have a lie, is the, like not the group to start with in this context. Another piece of evidence. And he started with the ladies, and it got me thinking, I mean, what if I can really belong? Because I want to tell you just a little bit about these ladies. Mary Magdalene had seven demons in her. Scripture said she was possessed by seven different demons that Jesus exercised out. Now, you might be having a bad season, but yo, like seven demons is probably worse than your job loss right now, okay? I'm just trying to give it some perspective. Seven demons gone. Okay, so let's, let's keep her out there. That's Mary. I guess she gets to belong. Well, who else? Uh, Joanna. Now, Joanna, lest you think that Jesus only operated in the margins. Lest you think that Jesus only operated with those far over here. Joanna was known to be a person of wealth. She had a good marriage and supported what Jesus was doing with her finances. So that means that people who are in, in extravagantly dark circumstances, filled with like whatever the case may be, whether it's demonic or addiction or depression or anxiety, whatever darkness owns you and calls your name, you get to belong. And if life's just pretty awesome, I have these suspenders on today, so I can't use them a lot. I'm going to use them right here. If life's just pretty awesome, you know, and things are going well, and you've got some means, and, and, and you know, you've got your family intact, and darkness is kind of come and go, guess what? You can come too. You can belong too. The same Jesus invites the dark from the not so dark or the people who don't realize it's dark. He's just like, man, you can all belong at my table. You don't have to go here and you don't have to go here. You just have to come to me. Well, there's another lady here that gets mentioned. Uh, what's her name? Well, her name's Mary, the mother of James. And all we really know about her, this isn't like the famous James up in the inner three. This is the, he's actually called James the Less. Bummer, that's your title, but whatever. This is the mother of this guy. And all that we know, at least all that I know, about this lady was that she was his mom. Moms. <laughs> Moms. Man, you are involved in like the most significant redemptive work that I know. The raising of children and pouring into the next generation. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Check this out. Whether you've got title or not, whether you've got employment outside the home or not, whatever it is that you might think of yourself or hear about you, you can come to. And then he goes to the apostles. And they're supposed to tell the apostles. And that's Peter who just sold them out. That's Thomas who's going to be like, show me the wounds, bro. Like, I'm not, I'm out. I got to touch. I got to, I mean, he goes gruesome. He's like, I'm not going to believe it. I got to touch. It goes to Matthew, the tax collector. It goes to a group of people who absolutely don't belong at Jesus' table. And here's what he whispers. You can come too. You just have to come. You just have to come. And so as we, as we look to close, we ask our final question. What if it's really true? Surely I am coming soon. Surely I am coming soon. As the team comes out to prepare, I love this, this is in Revelation 22, and Jesus makes this promise, and he's like this, listen, I left you in between meals, but I want you to know I'm coming soon. That may not mean a lot to those of you who don't understand suffering, but for those of you who understand what it's like to suffer, for those of you like Gabe who have chronic pain and illness, for those of you like Jerry who are in a wheelchair right now temporarily, for those of you who, who suffer back and forth with your addiction, for those of you who, who can't push away the darkness of depression when it rolls on, for those of you like me who know all the promises of God and yet find yourself battling 
this mind that seems to be divided and fearful. It's really good news. He's coming and he's coming soon. And here's what he promises. That when he comes, he's going to renew all things. So that means that Gabe is not only going to forget about the chronic illness that he walks with day in and day out. And it, and it doesn't just mean that Jerry one day is, is going to walk and he's going to have a body that functions the way he wants it to. And it doesn't just mean that those of us who've, who've got, like, whether it's mental illness or oppression or whatever it might be, it doesn't mean that we're just going to forget about it and we're just going to, like, be set free from it. What it means, listen, I <laughs> love this. Here's what it means. It means that Jesus, because of who he is, is going to come down and he's going to touch every single one of those infirmities. And he is going to individually, with the love of the Father, turn them upside down so that you are radically grateful for having had them because now you are going to experience a renewal that you could not have had without them. I don't know how that sets with you, but that's the kind of God, that's the kind of love, that's the kind of life that I want and that we offer here through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as we close, um, sometimes you've, you've had services close uh, and praying a prayer, or uh, sometimes you've had uh, services um, closed and, and just kind of a benediction and things like that. And so we're going to do something a little different today. And, and here's how it's going to roll. I'm going to invite you formally to, to the only really proper response to this idea of what if it's true, which is worship. I'm going to invite you to worship Jesus. Now, some of you are going to worship Jesus for the 500th time, and you're really good at You've been worshiping Jesus. I'm going to invite you to worship Jesus afresh and anew right where you are. And some of you, some of you are going to worship Jesus for the very first time, and it's going to be like a confession of faith for you. So as the song comes on and as the music starts, I'm not going to ask you to pray anything. I'm not going to, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to start worshiping this Jesus for the first time out of an expression of your faith, and then I'm going to ask you to come down and see me. I'm going to get right over here, and I think this is what the Father wants me to do. I think the father, because he's such a loving father and he loves to receive his children home, I think, I think he wants me to just kind of be his arms today and embrace you and love you and, and hug you. So if, if you're one of those people who's going to be worshiping Jesus for the first time today, man, would you, as you worship, come down and just let the Father's arms be placed around you and, and find you and love you and hold you and embrace you just as you are now forgiven and made new in Christ. Let's worship Jesus. And so let me pray for you guys. Let me pray over you guys and thank the Lord for having been here as he was in that first Easter. Father, thank you that you sent your Holy Spirit. And although we don't see Jesus in bodily form like your disciples and like the women did, Lord, we have been awoken to the reality of that through your Holy Spirit. And we thank you. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you, Jesus, for taking on a cross and dying in our place and overcoming our sin and death so that through faith in your finished work, we might be made forgiven, clean, and new. Jesus, even as we eat now and, and have Easter egg hunts with our kids and do all sorts of festivities. Jesus, we, we do it unto you knowing there is a meal coming that we believe in and that we belong to because of you. You are our great, great hope. We love you and we praise you. And we say all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Love you guys. Happy Easter. I'll see you out there.